Welcome back to the Traders Network. I'm Michael Yorby, your host. Thanks for joining us. We're also streaming to you live on yorbamedia.com. All right, my guest this segment uh, is Doug Croxel, Marathon Patent Group. And uh, uh, we're going to talk, by the way, their symbol, publicly traded company, M-A-R-A, -A, trading around $6 a share. And we're going to try and get Doug on the show so he can walk us through what he does and um, bring on uh, some of the different types of patents, walk through, you know, the patent licensing industry and go into some of the other uh, types of things that, that his company does. So as soon as he picks up the phone, I'm sure we'll bring him. He was supposed to give me a phone number, but we never got it. So I'm trying to sell. I'm having at least give him, uh, give him a call and a sell. We'll try and work these bugs out with our new booking agent. I have a little issue today on that one. So uh, anyway, in the meantime, I just want to let you know what we're going to do on this hour. Or from now on, if you haven't figured it out by now, is we're going to bring on CEOs. We're going to do our best to bring cutting edge technology and companies on the show so that we can walk through and give you the best possible choices for your investment dollars, not from the bottom up, but from the top down so you can figure out what the CEOs are saying and if they're really worth the money. And I'm going to try and get these things pre-vetted before they show up. I think we've got Doug on the phone now. Doug, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right, Doug. I was give us a little background on you and your company, and then we'll walk through some of the things that you do with your products. Sure. So um, my company is Marathon Patent Group. I'm the CEO and chairman of the company. Uh, Marathon is a patent acquisition and patent licensing company. Um, I've been in the kind of patent acquisition and licensing business for the last 10 years. And uh, we typically work with, we acquire our, our patents from a wide range of patent holders. Sometimes it's an individual inventor. Oftentimes it's uh, a Fortune 500 company, and, and it's everybody in between those two points. Um, typically our strategy is to acquire patents that cover a wide range of subject matter. So we're looking to really build diversity within our asset class. And by doing that, that allows us to really manage, uh, mitigate some of the risk, and it allows us to drive revenue that, that we can generate from these assets across a, a wide range of, of potential licensees. It, pro it also puts you in the cutting edge of new things coming to market. Uh, new things coming to market and things that have been in the market um, and adopted by companies who are who are in need of a license to that underlying technology. That's correct. All right. Well, give us an idea because this is a new topic for this for the show. The the size of the patent licensing industry and um, with respect and where you guys are within that uh, within the sector. Sure. Yeah. So the. So the kind of the licensing industry is is really large. Intellectual property licensing generates probably uh, billions of dollars of revenue uh, on an annual basis for U.S. companies and, and for a lot of companies across across the world. Um, the size of the potential market is pretty difficult to estimate. If you think about the fact that about one percent or maybe two percent of the patents actually ever get commercialized, which means converted into a product or a service and sold. So the vast majority of those assets are just essentially sitting on a shelf doing nothing. Um, where Marathon and, and other companies in my industry excel are, are by taking those assets and driving licensing revenues for Marathon and the patent owner through licensing that patent to another company who's using that invention um, without paying their fair share. So the market is is really hard to quantify. We, we know it's very, very big, but um, it's difficult to really assess how big it can become. All right. I, somebody likes your stock. Uh, in October, you hit a low somewhere just, uh, just under $4.60, and now it's rolling at $6. Uh, what do you attribute the, the the growth there? I mean, because obviously somebody likes your stock, they, and they and they want to keep buying it. So, what 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 is going on? Are you gaining market share? Are are you coming up with with new strategic partners that are that are making people want to buy this stock? Um, you know, I, I can't say for sure uh, as to the the rationale behind every investor's decision. Right to invest in Marathon, but what I can tell you is that, I, you know, we're, we're doing everything that we can to really execute on our business model. You're just and running the company it, right. Pardon? You're just running the company right. Well, I'm trying to, yes. <laughs> okay. um, 
but part of what what I really I tell people that I really serve two parties. I serve my investors, obviously, as a public company, and I also serve my inventors. And so part of our our model is not only to execute the acquisition and the licensing component, but to explain to the market what we're doing. And and oftentimes we get lumped in with some other um, patent acquisition and enforcement entities, and we're we're really quite different from a lot of those other companies. So I, I think what's happening is that you know we're we're doing the best that we can, and we're going to continue to deliver the message of why what Marathon does and why we do it and why we're different. And I think that message is starting to resonate with some of the shareholders. Well, let's drill down in there because, you know, there are another com- uh, a couple of companies that uh, have reached market valuations, some, some $2 billion. I think, uh, was it Vernex and uh, Acacia? And, uh, Vernetics and Acacia, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so you've got something that's, that's differentiating you from from that let's pause for a moment and let you bring that out show us the difference sure so um companies like vernetics yeah. uh there's a handful out there who have a patent portfolio that patent portfolio for example vernetics has been very valuable they've generated significant settlement and licensing revenues with that portfolio mm-hmm. what i seek to do that's slightly different than vernetics is I seek, I seek to diversify my asset base. So I want to own a lot of portfolios that some may read on the traditional um, tech market, software database, router market, while others may read on the, and when I say read on, I mean have the ability to license to companies in particular sectors. Mm-hmm. And um, we look to diversify outside of the traditional tech market with our asset class. So we like patents that read on companies and products that are outside of the traditional market. Mm -hmm. So the diversification strategy, which is not new to any asset class, is something that that really differentiates us from a lot of these other companies. And our strategy to drive revenue, our strategy is to seek a reasonable royalty rate with the parties who need a license and execute a license agreement and drive revenue. Oftentimes, if, uh, oftentimes companies would rather go through the litigation process, and there's a lot of companies in my space that that's, that's their focus, is to get through, get to trial, stay through that process, and seek, you know, a multiple, a huge reward at the end of that. We're looking to drive multiple revenue events by executing multiple license agreements. Okay, do you find, so, th- let me jump in there with you because you, you hit a hot button for me because of the litigation process. Do you find by not going down that road, it actually it leaves you more streamlined to develop uh, faster return on your revenue streams? So, uh, you know, we seek to get a license from, from the parties prior to filing lawsuits. Unfortunately, you don't really get anyone's attention uh, by asking nicely for a license. So oftentimes <laughs> we, we have no choice okay. but to file a lawsuit. And, and what that does is it expedites, it really brings the two parties to the table and it expedites the time to monetization or the ability to generate revenue. And so, yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's the best dispute resolution platform that we have as a patent owner. And um, if I could do it outside of litigation, I would. But we haven't figured out um, how to accomplish that with meaningful results. Obviously, please doesn't work in your business. N- not always. All right, let's do this. Let's take a break because you've got 118 patents. I want to talk about the different portfolios of patents that you have on the other side and, and, and some of the other things that you brought to the table today. Can, can, we, can you come back for another segment? Absolutely. A special thanks to Monk Media and 1-800-PublicRelations.com for all their PR and media support. All right, we'll be right back on the other side of this break with Doug Croxall, CEO, Marathon Patent Group. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Traders Network. I'm Michael Yorba, your host. Thanks for joining us. We're also streaming to you live at yorbamedia.com and broadcasting to you from the Dallas KFXR 1190 AM Clear Channel Studios. All right, Doug Croxall, CEO, Marathon Patent Group. Where we left off, Doug, was the uh, total patents that you have, 118 of them, and you've got them broken down into subsidiaries and portfolios. Can you break that open for us? 
Yeah, so we have um, Marathon has acquired over essentially the last year uh, 118 patents, which we hold those patents in wholly owned subsidiaries of Marathon. So names like Cyberphone, Relay IP, Sampo, Vantage Point, CRFD Research, etc. And each uh, each subsidiary has patent assets within it, and oftentimes those assets um, kind of cover the same technology. Sometimes we have multiple what we call patent families within those subsidiaries. And those are the subsidiaries that are out driving revenue through uh, different licensing campaigns. Okay. All right. Uh, so how many different portfolios are you currently working with, and um, who are the on, on the other side, say the defendants on these? So we have uh, essentially seven portfolios that we are um, engaged in active uh, licensing, mm-hmm. uh, oftentimes that's, that includes litigation, as we talked about earlier. Right. And, you know, we, we typically, unlike other people in the industry, we don't seek to drive license revenues from startups or mom and pops or coffee shops. We're, we're picking fights and looking to drive revenue with the large infringers. So companies like AT&T, DirecTV, Apple, Etc. I mean the 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 heavyweights, if you will. Right. All right. I guess that gives you a real diversified pool. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, uh, where do the sources of the patents come from? I mean, you buy them. How do you decide which portfolios you are going to acquire? So, um, I had mentioned that we've been at this for uh, a little over a decade, and the process of of. really understanding what the asset can do from a licensing perspective is critical. So our due diligence process, which um, can be lengthy, uh, allows us to really understand the novelty of the invention. It allows us to understand which companies include that patented technology in their product offering. It allows us to understand what the damages model or what the revenue that, that should be generated from a license agreement with that company should be. And prior to acquiring any, any patent assets, we have a really good understanding who needs a license and what that license revenue should be that we generate. And so that process uh, is something that we go through religiously, and we'll go through that process whether the patent seller is an individual inventor or you know, a Fortune 500 company, which, which are also the sources of a lot of our IP. Okay. All right. Well, let's walk through a couple of these things um, that uh, uh, you were the CEO, I, I think, uh, um, maybe, excuse me, let me back up, the Fire Pond patent portfolio. Uh, I understand you made some money with this. Yeah. Um, well, that, that, that transaction happened a long time ago. Uh, so about a little over 10 years ago, there was a public company called Fire Pond, and um, I had acquired that public company and taken it private. Uh, the company had uh, a portfolio of patent assets. Uh, I called a, a friend of mine who was also a business advisor to me, a gentleman by the name of Eric Spangenberg, who is still a friend of mine and business advisor, and also a significant shareholder in Marathon. And I'd asked him what he thought the value of the patent portfolio was, and, and he um, he explained the patent licensing business to me. Uh, we set up uh, some subsidiary, some uh, LLCs, and he was able to generate over $100 million in licensing revenue with those assets. Uh, it, it's what became the foundation of IP Navigation, which is a company that he founded and, and still owns today. So that was actually the first portfolio, and um, that really got, got me uh, heavily excited and involved in the patent space. Walk me through uh, the due diligence under and underwriting process. So, again, you know, we, we, when we look at the asset, we'll look at it from a couple different viewpoints. We want to understand what was, the, what was the discourse between inventor and the prosecuting attorneys, the attorneys that help an inventor get a patent issued from the patent office. Mm-hmm. We want to understand what we call the file history. What did, the pat- what did the invention start off as, 
and what was it modified through the application process. And that really gives us a good sense of what the invention is. Uh, we then look at the market. Is this, an, is this an invention? Is this a patented technology that's being deployed in the market? Or is it a patented technology that the market has never adopted? Or is it a, or, or is it a technology that the market has yet to ad- adopt? So we go through that kind of business scenario. If it's something that we see in the market, if it's a technology that's being used by other companies, we'll create what we think a reasonable um, royalty stream of revenue would be, and then we price accordingly. We obviously want to know that we can mitigate as much risk away from an acquisition as we can, and we want to put as much value into the public companies we can. So we, we really look at driving a pretty good deal for the investor prior to the acquisition. Okay. Um, you've, you've touched on this before, uh, earlier in, uh, today, but I, I wanted to see if you could drill down a little bit on, on your financial model for our listeners. Give, break, give us some breakdowns on how that works. Sure. So we're not a litigation model. Right. I'm, I'm not going to file a suit against you know, a single company or a handful of companies and just wait until three and a half years and I'm in trial and hopefully the jury or the judge makes, makes the right decision. And then we're able to hold on to that uh, verdict through the appellate process. It's a, it's a long, difficult process, and it doesn't necessarily generate meaningful revenue for a public company. However, it is, it is a process that we do go through, but what we do is we supplement that with multiple assets driving multiple revenue events through what we call licensing campaigns. So of the seven portfolios that we have, that are actively being enforced. We've driven revenue with four of those portfolios. And, um, you know, we expect that of the 70 plus defendants that we have named in suits, that a vast majority of those will be revenue events, you know, over the next one to two and a half years. And so our model is really one of spreading the revenue out across multiple uh, defendants through owning multiple assets. It's it's no different than any diversity diversification play in any asset class. Now it seems to me that the uh, the windfalls the of uh, the revenue stream that come from your business processes are so much greater than your overhead. Give us a, a peek into that part of the world. So I've, I, I'm a big believer in um, variable costs. So. Uh, litigation can be very expensive for both defendants and plaintiffs. So what, what we do is seek to find uh, partners who believe in our assets and our strategy, and those partners only get paid if there's a revenue event. So that's called contingency in, uh, in our world. So my licensing agents, my litigation team, uh, they're all paid on a contingent basis. So when I make money, when Marathon makes money, they get paid. That gives us tremendous scalability and operating leverage. So, as you recall, last year we had zero licensing campaigns that were active. We currently have seven. You know, my hope is to have a multiple of that one year from today, and and we will not have to add any real meaningful overhead in order to accomplish that. That gives us, if, if we maintain our discipline on our cost side, that gives our, our revenue a lot of leverage, a lot of scalability, which should result in um, meaningful earnings. Okay, that's a very good answer for me. All right, real quick, we got about a minute and a half left. Let's focus for a moment on shareholder value in the portfolio. Are there any particular uh, portfolios that we should be paying attention to? I mean, it's, it, I get this question a lot. Usually it, it comes in the form of what patents do you like the most? And I explain to people that, you know, patents are like children. You kind of love them all the same. Um, however, oftentimes some children excel uh, past others. And so, yeah, there's, you know, I'm, I, I do like all of our portfolios or we wouldn't own them. But there are a couple of new acquisitions which I'm really excited about. Um, we bought some assets from a company called Telecommunication Systems in uh, late Q3 of last year. We have, I think, nine defendants in suit. Um, that subsidiary is called CRFD Research. 
there's actually two different patent families within that subsidiary. Uh, one patent family is uh, a patent, we refer to patents by the last three digits. That patent 486 is web page content translator. So, for example, uh, the web page that you look at on your smartphone is going to be configured differently than the web page you look at on your desktop computer. So we're, we're very excited about that particular patent family. Um, within that subsidiary, there's another uh, patent family that can, is, is titled System for Automated Mid-Session User-Directed Device-to-Device Session Transfer System. Very complicated title that basically allows you, if you're watching or reviewing, listening to music, watching a show, you hit pause, you go to a different device at a later point in time, and you pick up that, um, that TV show or that movie from the same point, uh, that family reads on that ability to accomplish that. So we think we've got, you know, really a lot of excitement, a lot of revenue opportunity uh, with, that, with that family to name one of you know, nine, essentially, that we could talk about. Wow. Well, we're, you know what? I, you really opened up the can of worms for me. I want to, I want you to come back because you are on, uh, you have your hands on the next big breakthroughs, and I want to be able to bring those up, and then maybe we can spend more time going through some of these big breakthroughs that we hit at the end of the segment. Where, How can our audience reach you to know more? Uh, I mean, they can always go to our website, um, marathonpg.com. That's probably the best place. All of our patents and um, complaints and everything else that they want to learn about the company is there, as well as uh, contacts for investor relations and public relations. That's probably the best place. Very, very exciting information for me, Doug. Thank you so much for taking the time and being on the show. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right, Doug Croxell, CEO. That's Marathon Patent Group, and their stock symbol is M-A-R-A. All right, come back right after this break, and we're going to bring Vince Molinari, Gate Global Impact, and he's going to talk to us about a new product we're going to introduce on the show. A special thanks to Monk Media and 1-800-PublicRelations.com for all their PR and media support. I'll be right back. 